Hey, this is Doug for Flat Earth Workshop. A little bit longer segment today because we'll be discussing the Tamiya 135th scale tank kit, but mostly the M4 Sherman tank. And to begin talking about that, we need to start with the M3 tank. After World War I, the U.S. really let down their research and development. So around 1939-1940, it was very evident that uh, the U.S. was behind in tank design. So they began to work on what generally was known as the M3 Lee tank. But that was only the U.S. version. Since the British were already involved in World War II and the U.S. was not, they took the U.S. tank, which they considered really not up to specs, and upgraded the tank and called it the Grant. And they kept using that tank, even though all the rest of the countries had given up. They used that tank until the end of the war in 1945. The first Lee prototype was introduced in late 1940. And you'll see here it rolls out in front of the brass to an enthusiastic reception, breaking down buildings and knocking down telephone poles. But it really had some serious drawbacks, uh, one of which is the hull uh, was actually not welded together, but it was put together with rivets. And if it would take a side hit, those rivets could explode inside the hull and cause serious injuries to man and equipment. The other problem was is the 75 millimeter gun had to be sponson mounted on the side, which meant in battle they couldn't do the hull down formation. When the M4 Sherman was introduced, it became one of the most loved and most hated tanks of World War II. And here's why. They were going up against much better tanks when they first were introduced. Uh, the Panzer I, which was a line armor craft uh, built in 1934, but the Panzer II then became medium armor with a 20 millimeter cannon and it was serviced until the end of the war. The Panzer III, things got serious. They had a 75 millimeter cannon along with heavy armor. Then came the big gun. The big 88 millimeter Tiger I, which used an anti-aircraft gun inside the turret. The Tiger II was just an improvement on a theme using the same gun, but more horsepower and better armor. British and American tank crews were told that their tank was an amazing fighting machine that would handle anything the Germans could throw at them. Well, as they found out soon, that was absolutely not the truth. Starting in Tunisia and Northern Africa, they took heavy losses. As a matter of fact, in some skirmishes, lost every tank. These battles became a propaganda film for the Germans, showing the superiority in arms. At the start of World War I, things were going very badly for the Allied tank crews, so improvements had to begin immediately. One of the big problems on D-Day was that the, uh, the French had these things called hedgerows, where they would grow between fields and they were very difficult to get through. The Germans would basically aim at a hole and just pick off tanks as they came through. Here's where the fighting men become a very integral part of improving these tanks. Sergeant Curtis Cullen had an idea to improve the tank that helped to win the war. He designed this thing called the hedge chopper using just surplus steel and I-beams and they mounted these to a big variety of tanks and it worked terrifically. He actually received the Legion of Merit Award for his design. Another unfortunate thing about the Sherman tank was that they tended to catch fire and when they did they would explode. <laughs> Servicemen even called it a Ronson after the advertisement for the Ronson lighter. In late 1944, the M4A3 or EZ8 was introduced with a much better suspension system, a high velocity gun and much more armor. Well, let's get to the fun part. Today's build is by Landon Ritterling. Hey Landon, thanks for coming back and, and tell me how you got interested in the uh, Sherman EZ8. No problem. The Sherman has always been one of my most favorite uh, tanks from World War II. Something about it is so cool. It's seen in every theater of the war. And it's widely considered one of the most popular tanks uh, that, that's really seen in a lot of movies. You see it in the movie Fury, uh, it's seen in other movies such as Saving Private Ryan and, and many other documentaries. And this uh, particular model is made by Tamiya, it's a new tool, so all of the, uh, the parts are very crisp and there's lots of resolution on every bit and piece that you see put together here. With this model, I just kind of wanted to go with a standard green color, which I have done lots of modeling on. With this model, you see tons of different uh, techniques being put into place. You see lots of rust coming into play, uh, lots of weathering on the particular metal pieces around the tank. 
Uh, I really wanted to simulate the idea of a tank being worn in battle. Uh, here you can see some of the hatches that are open. The original model actually had it, uh, so you could glue the hatches either open or closed, but I didn't like that, so I decided to drill out where the hatches were linked together with the model uh, and allowed them to be open and closed. On the tracks down here you can see lots of weathering techniques that are being put into play. There's lots of different dry pigments and different paints that have been sprayed on off my airbrush. And all of this is supposed to work in concert together to make it look more weathered and worn. You're not really going to see this when you're looking at the model uh, from a normal direction, but it still makes it interesting. And these effects can be done by anybody. I'm still an amateur modeler, uh, not master by any means. And you can see if you, when you look up close on this turret here that there's lots of different effects going on. I've gone in with very detailed brushes and really try to model the surface and make it look like it's been worn and dirtied uh, from use. You can see the amount of detail that you can cram into a small area. All of this I did without any aids to my eyes, uh, all done by hand. And you can see this hatch as well that I used, uh, some of my skills to create. On the front of this model you can see lots of the different things have been molded pretty well. You can see the travel lock in the front there, some of the other machine guns, things like that. On the side of the tank, you can see the HVSS, or Horizontal Volute Suspension System. Uh, that, this back portion, of course, is the motor carriage where you can see uh, the housing that's been where the engine is placed. Back to the bogies, you can see uh, the difference between this and the original Shermans. Uh, they're called the Easy 8 because it actually was an easier ride uh, for the crew on board because the Horizontal Volute System allowed more play on the bogies, making the suspension easier riding. You can see a lot of the different modeling going on in this shot here as well. Uh, try to pay attention to areas where there might be wear and tear and try to get some convincing chipping effects uh, so that it looks like, you know, people have been scrambling over this thing for quite a few months. The Easy 8 of course was up gun from the original Shermans, increasing the size of the cannon from 75 millimeters to 76 millimeters, and the barrel was also lengthened. This made the uh, gun higher velocity, allowing for more penetration power. Uh, also, the Americans had quite a few different options when it came to their ammunition types. Uh, the most well-known Sherman variant, the Firefly, had the 17-pounder put in place. However, the turret was so small and cramped, the gun had to be turned sideways, or the breech was sideways, which caused for all kinds of problems for the operations uh, for the crews. So really, that was a stopgap measure, and this American version is the true successor to the early year. Uh, Shermans that you see in the war. Well, great job on the model, and uh, thanks for coming back. Thank you so much.